What's up, everyone? Grayson the Dean 221 Nichols here on the Elite Rounders YouTube channel, as always, and I have some good news and bad news for you all. Uh, starting with the bad news, it looks like we won't get part two of the Helmuth Negranu duel until May, so we got to wait a few weeks for that one. But the good news is we got a cool hand uh, to go over with the two of them from a few years ago that I wanted to cover, and even better, we're doing a little giveaway over at Elite Rounders. So what you got to do to enter the raffle, you just need to subscribe on YouTube here. You need to follow us at Elite Rounders on Instagram and then post in the comments your Instagram name and we'll enter you into a raffle for a free month of poker coaching. So again, subscribe here on YouTube, follow us on Instagram and post your Instagram name in the comments and we'll get you entered in that raffle and the drawing will be on April 30th for a free month of group poker coaching at Elite Rounders. So on to the good stuff. Um, I've been looking through hands, you know, after watching the last duel with Negronio and Helmuth, I've been, uh, you know, going on YouTube, falling into that rabbit hole of just kind of watching all these cool old hands. And this one really stood out to me. And so I wanted to go over it with you guys. Um, this was, I believe, a, uh, I think this was, I'm not sure if it was a final table. They didn't really give context to it, but this was a hell of a, hell of a group they had. Uh, Dan Cates at the table, obviously Helmuth, Negranu, um, just tough lineup in general. And so the blinds in this hand are 8K, 16K, and Helmuth limps in from the small blind with King-9 suited. I found it kind of funny that the announcers were like, oh, this feels a lot like aces. And I'm like, well, have you ever watched Helmuth play? Like he just limps everything, right? So definitely don't feel like it's aces here. Funny side note, just at how oblivious I believe Phil Locke, the announcer, was uh, at, at Helmut's game. So Phil limps in with King Nine of Spades here. I think that's a fine limp. You know, I think your hand plays really well against the random stuff Daniel checks back, and it's really definitely good enough to call a raise from Daniel. So I'm cool with this limp. I think it makes sense. I also think the hand's good enough to go ahead and come in for a raise here as well. You really can't make a mistake in this spot um, by Phil unless he limped and then folded. Daniel looks down at the 8-6 off, just kind of a nothing hand, but he decides to pounce on Phil's limp, which he is perceiving as leak, weak. So he goes ahead and raises it up to just under 50K, and Phil quickly calls as he should. So this is where things get a little goofy. And just a little tip for you guys, you know, something that I've noticed gets kind of cool, you know, for you know, some of the live uh, players, like, you know, see this on TV and, and replicate it, especially something that Helmuth does. He checks in the dark here before the flop comes out. I don't think this is a very effective play. I just can't really ever find an instance where checking in the dark has been beneficial. The only spot where it is reasonable is a spot where you're going to be checking almost always. So, you know, if you do defend from the big blind, for instance, against a late position raiser, checking in the dark there is somewhat reasonable because you're probably going to be checking over 95% of the time anyway, right? But I don't think it's that beneficial unless you have some weird dynamic where you're check raising flops a lot they're betting every flop like it just doesn't really help you a lot so it strikes me as something that people view as kind of fancy uh, but just doesn't really do much for us so I, I advise you guys to avoid the whole checking in the dark thing doesn't really do too much for us so Helmuth checks and the flop comes out ace ace king so obviously Helmuth's got the goods here there's no way Daniel can win this hand essentially unless it's running eights or sixes he already checked in the dark Daniel checks back which I think is interesting I think there's an argument for just c betting here because there's a lot of hands that Helmuth would probably just fold quickly you know like twos through eights for instance um you know small suited connectors uh, that would still be beating uh Daniel like nine ten suited for instance but I also don't mind the check from Daniel because I think there's an argument that if he checks here, he could really rep the ace later on, right? So a little spoiler alert, foreshadowing, you might say. Turn comes out of nine. So Phil improves, uh, well, now Daniel's dead. Phil improves slightly, but his hand remains somewhat the same. You know, kings and aces at this point with a nine kicker. So it doesn't do much, gives him some more boat outs, obviously, though. He checks again, and Daniel checks again. So this one is where I'm a little torn because I do think that if Daniel was checking and laying a trap on the flop with an ace, it would probably make sense to start betting this turn and going for value. Because if you keep checking, you know, I tell this to my students often, like you don't want to check yourself into oblivion when you have a good value hand, right? So I think if he had an ace, he would usually can start to bet here. 
Um, you know, if Helmuth has a king, he's going to get a lot of value. And if he doesn't have a king, he's not going to make much anyway, right? So I would imagine that Daniel will usually be betting with an ace here, but I think it's reasonable to assume that he keeps checking with an ace because he thinks Phil is so weak. So they go check, check again. And the river brings uh, the beautiful nine of diamonds. So now Helmuth has his boat and Daniel is playing the board, right? So this is another concept I really want to discuss with you guys. The pot's a little over 100,000 now and Helmuth bets out 20,000. This is a horrible bet, okay? Now, this bet would be reasonable if Phil was inducing action from Daniel. He was betting a little bit, like a fifth of the pot, you know, throwing chum in the water, hoping that Daniel pounces and raises as a bluff, right? So if that was Phil's intention, this would be totally fine, right? I think it's reasonable because you know what? It worked. Daniel went ahead and raised to 140,000. But here's the weird part. Phil snap folds. He immediately folds. He doesn't think about it. He just snap folds. Just a horrible play, okay? Now let's talk about how he could have played this correctly, okay? I think there's a couple lines Phil could take here. I think he could check call here, which is reasonable if he is worried that Daniel it does have an ace, which like I said, Daniel's taken a very compelling line. You know, it's reasonable to think he could have that. Um, so check calling is fine to minimize his losses, mitigate risk. But I also think the play for Helmuth is close. Like, I like that he bet, but his sizing was really bad based on what he's trying to do, right? And I think that what would have made more sense is if Helmuth had bet something like 60,000, like just over half pot, then if Daniel raises, it would make sense to fold. Because, like, how would Daniel have anything but an ace if Phil bet big on the river, like, a, you know, a good, like, half 60% pot bet, and then Daniel raises. To me, that's a spot where Daniel will not be bluffing very often, right? So I think it would be a very reasonable fold of his low full house in that instance. But instead, Phil bets one-fifth of the pot. This is a bet that is that looks weak, right? So if you do something that looks weak, you may induce action from your opponents. So his hand is too good here to make a weak bet and then fold to a raise. His hand would be fine to make a strong bet and then fold to a raise, but not the other way around. So I do think sizing really matters when you guys get into these spots. And something I often tell my students as well, when you bet larger, in spots, especially like this on the river, you give yourself more of an off ramp to escape, right? You know, you, I think it's very rare that an opponent will bluff, will bluff raise you when you bet large on the river, right? So the bigger you bet in certain spots, the less likely it is your opponent bluffs you and the easier it will be for you to find an escape route, for you to find that tough fold, right? But the smaller you bet, you are no longer afforded that ability to make that fold because now your opponent has bluffs in his range. Sure enough, Phil makes that one-fifth bet. Daniel pounces, raises to 140, and Phil snap folds. Just a bad, bad play overall, you know? Um, you know, and I think what it comes down to is the bet is fine. You just got to bet bigger. And you need to think of how you're perceived, you know? I think Phil is a very guttural player. He's got great instincts. I think that's what's gotten him so far. He's an incredible hand reader. But I think the problem is that he just acts too fast. And I'll say this is one of my biggest mistakes too. I've had some hands that have cost me thousands of dollars of equity where I just acted way too fast and I really regret it afterwards. That is something I work on in my game as well. Take an extra 10 seconds, think about what you're doing and you will be shocked how much it can help you. And sometimes you'll find a different play in that time that you're thinking about it. So hope you guys enjoyed this hand. We'll be back next week, as always, going over the Poker After Dark episodes on Tuesday morning and reviewing a little more Helmuth Negranu action on Thursday. We're going to keep going with these um, leading up to the duel to kind of because it gets me pumped up to watch them play again. I lost 50 bucks to my student betting on Negranu last time, so I got to get my money back from him. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Again, don't forget about our raffle. Go ahead and subscribe here on YouTube, follow us on Instagram, and post your Instagram name in the comments, and we will get you in that raffle on April 30th. Best of luck this week, everyone. Going to get my COVID vaccine today, actually, so pretty stoked. Hope everyone out there is uh, being safe and doing well, and we'll see you guys in the felt. Take care.